It's a, it's a pleasure to open this school. Uh, so I'm going to be lecturing about the conformal bootstrap. Uh, thanks to those who filled out the, uh, the questionnaire. It was very helpful to, to understand your level and not to repeat things that everyone knows. So um, mm, it would be nice if we could uh, jump kind of head on into the subject and then understand the details. So, uh, so what's the conformal bootstrap? So the conformal bootstrap is an approach to CFTs in D dimensions, so D Euclidean dimensions. So D can be equal to two. Uh, that, that's already interesting, but mostly in these lectures I'm, I'm going to consider D larger than or equal to three. But also in D equal to two, there remain many things to be done. So, so what are CFTs? Uh, why are CFTs important? Uh, it's, uh, let me say a few things about that. So when, you, when we do quantum field theory in general, uh, then uh, most of the time we are dealing with a massive quantum field theory. So if you have massive quantum field theory, then you have particles of a certain mass m, uh, which you can scatter also if you are in Minkowski signature. But if you are in, in Euclidean signature, then the way you detect a massive quantum field theory, you look at the correlation functions. And the correlation functions, they decay exponentially. They, they go as e to the uh, minus uh, r over some distance, which is called the correlation length. <clears throat> so these are called massive, or alternatively, they, they're also sometimes called gapped. So this is called gapped. And the mass of the particle is called the mass gap, and so on. But then sometimes you, you deal, sometimes you end up dealing with the theory which is uh, massless or gapless. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna write, I'm gonna write large. So massless or gapless, so this happens when, so the mass goes to zero or the correlation length goes to infinity. So when, when this happens, then the correlation functions in such theory, they uh, scale as one over r to some power. So this is a clearly different behavior. So typically in order to I'm going to give some examples. So typically in order to reach this behavior, you have to fine tune some parameters. You have to fine tune some parameters in the original theory. So for most choices of the parameters, you're going to have a gap theory. And for some very specific choices, you will have, uh, you will have the gapless theory. And, and so, uh, so the, the two-point functions, they scale like one over r to some power, but not only the two-point functions. So all correlation functions, they, uh, you know, they, they, they exhibit power law behavior. So when you rescale all the distances by some factor, then the correlation function also rescales by, by some factor. And this is called scale invariance. And uh, as most of you know, um, this scale invariance in uh, relativistic quantum field theory is uh, almost always, so generically gets enhanced to conformal invariance. 
conformal variance, and so you get a CFT. Any questions about that? All right, uh, and so, uh, you know, so, so, so CFTs, they form uh, a subclass of all quantum field theories, um, which, has an, which has an additional symmetry. So in addition to rotation invariance and to Poincaré, it has uh, scale invariance and moreover conformal invariance. So it is still a special subclass, yes? So there was a question, uh, what are the specific conditions for scale invariance enhanced to conformal invariance? Uh, so there is no um, full understanding of this question. So, uh, so some conditions help. For example, the existence of the local stress tensor operator is very important for this. Uh, sometimes unitarity helps and so on. But uh, there is no... Um, and so there is some understanding, uh, but there is no, you, you would have to go like case by case basis. But generically, this happens. I was not planning to talk about this because most of the people said that they are familiar with this uh, question. But uh, I can may maybe mention later on, or, or we can discuss in private if you're interested. Uh, so, uh, so what I said is that the CFTs are special. So it's in, you know, if something is special, you are interested in this. But also, uh, if you understand CFTs, then you can go back and try to understand the massive theories. So CFTs, they, they are kind of, the reason why, one second reason why they're important is that they are kind of a signposts. in the space of all quantum field theories. What I mean by that is that if you have a CFT, you have a, you have a one CFT, then you can perturb it by uh, a relevant operator and you can start an RG flow, which can bring you to another CFT. Okay, so this the first CFT is called CFT UV. Another CFT is called CFT IR. Uh, so it can be, or it can be nothing. So if, if this RG flow gets you a massive theory, then this CFTIR is just nothing. And so you can, you can start with, the, if, you, if you start first by understanding CFTs, then you can, in the second step, understand the RG flows connecting the CFTs. And understanding these RG flows would be understanding already all quantum field theories. So that's why, you know, CFTs are a good, if your goal in the end is to understand the roads the roadmap of all quantum field theories, the space of all quantum field theories, then CFTs is a good starting point. To understand CFTs is a good starting point. So, so these are theoretical reasons for the importance of CFTs, but also there is an experimental reason for the importance. Uh, so CFTs describe uh, phase transitions. Uh, second order phase transitions. In real materials, so that's okay, this is a high energy school, so uh, I'm not sure how much you're interested in this, but you should be interested. I think it's very beautiful. So, so take a material. Material is a, dirty, is a dirty thing, so it's some sort of uh, crystal, you know, or a lattice. You can think of it as some sort of lattice. And uh, on each point of this lattice, there is an atom, which has some degrees of freedom, spins, and so on. So it's not a, there's no continuum limit here, and there's no rotation invariance on the scale of the lattice. Uh, but now, uh, suppose you, you change the temperature, in such a way that this material approaches the second order phase transition. So at the second order phase transition, the correlation length goes to infinity. And this means that all the microscopic details, all the dirty and interesting microscopic details of this material uh, become 
less and less important. So the, the thing which becomes important at, in the limit of large collision length are the, uh, you know, the symmetry that this material possesses. Um, and basically, that's it. So this is, uh, this is the phenomenon of universality. And so, at the phase transition point, uh, the correlation functions of this uh, microscopic theory are going to be described, are going to be universal, and are going to be described by a CFT. And one, uh, one example, so this is going to connect nicely. So example is the three-dimensional easing model. Well, actually, not just three-dimensional, but uh, easing model. So if you take, uh, so everybody knows what the easing model is? is it, no? Well, easing model, it's a microscopic model for uh, ferromagnetism. So you take, you take a lattice in D dimensions, and then on, on each point of the lattice, you put plus or minus. You put a, a variable SI, which takes values plus or minus, and then you write, uh, you write the interaction energy uh, as, a, as a sum of pairwise nearest neighbor interactions. So you have SI as J over all uh, nearest neighbor pairs of, of these variables, which are called spins. Ising spins uh, with a minus sign to get a ferromagnetic interaction. So the, the interaction favors energetically where all these all these spins point in the same direction. And then, uh, so there is still a, a parameter. So this is a classical statistical mechanics problem. So there is a temperature, and then if the temperature is very large, then basically these variables are going to be randomly pointing in, in, in all directions. Uh, if the temperature is low, then, then you will have ordering. So you'll have all spins pointing in one direction. And then there's going to be some critical temperature, T equal ETC, uh, where there's going to be a critical point separating these two phases. And this critical point uh, is described by a CFT. So this is true in d equal two and d equal three dimensions. And actually, if you if you know the two-dimensional CFT, as many of you do, then in d equal two you know this CFT. In d equal two, uh, this CFT which describes the critical point of uh, of the two-dimensional easing model is the M34 minimal model CFT. describes critical point. Dimensional easing model. So in fact, this CFT is sometimes called the easing model CFT, but it's not the easing model because it's only the easing model describes the behavior at any temperature, while this CFT describes the behavior only at the critical temperature. So, so this CFT, you know, it's, it's an exactly solvable CFT, you know, all, we know all about it. And it contains, uh, you know, it encapsulates all the long distance behavior of this lattice model. So if you now take a different lattice, instead of taking square lattice, you take a, a, a triangular lattice, then the microscopic model changes, but the CFT describing the critical point. So the critical temperature changes, but the CFT describing the critical point stays the same. So this is the universality. 
So that's, uh, uh, that's very, very beautiful. So, so where, should we, uh, where should we go from that? And uh, uh, so in, uh, so when you have a CFT, you have uh, various local operators For example, this, this two-dimensional CFT has local operators sigma and epsilon. And uh, the, the numbers, the most important numbers that you would like to, to know are the dimensions of these operators. So delta sigma and delta epsilon. So these dimensions, they determine the behavior of the correlation functions and large distances, so sigma of zero, sigma of r. Uh, goes as 1 over r to the power 2 delta sigma. And analogously, analogously epsilon. And, you know, once you solve the CFT, you know that in, in 2D, the dimension of sigma is equal 1, 8, and the dimension of epsilon is equal to exactly 1. But now let's, let's go to the three dimensions. Let's go to the three-dimensional case. So again, uh, you know, you will have the easing model, you will have a critical temperature, you will have a CFT which describes this critical temperature. So what do we know about the CFT? And until recently, people uh, did not really take this uh, perspective. Uh, people, so there was a very different way uh, in thinking about the two-dimensional case where you have the CFT and everything is beautiful, and then the three-dimensional case. So the three-dimensional case, everything was considered dirty, and CFT is not going to help you for reasons that I'm going, uh, I'm going to explain why there were these prejudices. And so until recently, in 3D, people were taking a very different approach to understanding the properties of the critical point in, uh, in the easing model. And uh, the, the way people were approaching this problem was through the Landau-Ginzburg uh, effective theory. which is actually nothing but the lambda phi to the fourth theory. So they were considering uh, the theory of scalar field in three dimensions. So, you know, you consider this Lagrangian and you already feel that uh, you are doing great because now you have uh, you can do perturbative computations in this theory. You can compute correlation functions perturbatively in lambda. Uh, and, uh, and you can see, I mean, you, 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 might, you might think that you would compute these correlation functions as a function of, so mass squared, you keep, say, lambda fixed, and then m squared is your, is your parameter that you vary. And you see if m squared is negative, then you are going to be in the phase where the symmetry is going to be spontaneously broken. If m squared is positive, then you are going to be in the phase where the web of the field phi is going to be zero. And then somewhere in between, there's going to be the critical point. And you, you might think that uh, you, you will be able to find this critical point using quantum field theory. Uh, the difficulty with this approach is that this is a strongly coupled problem. So, so looking for, uh, so lambda in 3D, so in 3D, uh, lambda is massive. So lambda has dimension of, uh, of mass. And so the critical point, critical point is located at lambda over m order one. And so it's a, it's a strongly coupled uh, it's a strongly coupled point. You cannot 
easily reach this point in perturbation theory. And so people uh, invented various tricks to get around this problem. So one trick is to work not in 3D, but in four minus epsilon dimensions. So in four minus epsilon dimensions, this coupling lambda is very, very weakly relevant. And so you can do perturbation theory. You can reach this critical point in perturbation theory. And then you take this four minus epsilon dimensional result, and then you extrapolate it to epsilon equal to one. Uh, so this is called the epsilon expansion. It was invented by Wilson and Fisher. And uh, numerically, at least in, for low orders in epsilon, this was uh, numerically uh, successful. So it was given results in agreement with experiment for the critical point of this theory. But as you see, it's a very different, it's a very philosophically, a very different approach. So there was this big dichotomy where in three dimensions you had to do some field theory computation, while in 2D there was this beautiful CFT. So uh, recently, more recently, uh, this imbalance has been restored. So now, and this is what I'm, I would like to talk about, so now it's known how to compute in 3D using CFT. So these parameters, delta sigma and delta epsilon, we can now compute also in 3D, not using this field theory uh, Detour, it's a detour because, why is this a detour? Because, because conformal field theory, uh, as I said, is universal. So it does not depend on the microscopic physics. If you take the easing model on if you, or if you take this lambda phi to the fourth theory, the critical point is the same. So you, you should ask yourself, so if this critical point is the same, why should you uh, solve the critical point by flowing to it from some microscopic Lagrangian. So this is a really an unnecessary, it seems like an unnecessary detour. So it would be nice to, to find a method which focuses directly on the critical point, on the CFT, and solves for these parameters, delta sigma and delta epsilon and other numbers, directly from CFT. And so uh, in 2D, it was known how to do this. And in 3D, it's been discovered relatively recently. And so if you, if you do these computations, then uh, this is not just some abstract method. It's really a method which allows you to do computations uh, and very, very precise computations. So, so the advantage of this is that, okay, it gives you new perspective on the problem. It is more general because uh, you know, b before the only CFTs that, that people could uh, consider were the CFTs which had some microscopic Lagrangian description or a lattice model. But there are also some CFTs which do not have uh, Lagrangian description, which are important for string theory. And so now uh, you know, th those CFTs were not accessible, but now they're accessible, so applicable uh, also to CFTs without Lagrangians. So like, uh, like the 2 comma 0 6D theory. And it's very precise. So this method, uh, it, it turns out to be extremely precise. And uh, for example, the just to give you just to give you the example of its precision. So the value of delta sigma is now known using these methods with uh, six digits. five digits to be precise. So this, this is the, the current 
the current world record, which I think uh, in a paper which will appear this week, or maybe next week, is going to be improved by one more digit. So, uh, so this, by the way, is much better than whatever you can do using this uh, field theory approach. Because this field theory approach, given that it's a strongly coupled problem, at some point you run out uh, in difficulties with summing Feynman diagrams because perturbation theory diverges, uh, while here, uh, you know, here there's no this difficulty. This method is non-perturbative. So uh, I think it would be nice if at the end of this, uh, if at the end of this lecture course, uh, you would get some idea about how, how this, uh, you know, how do we get these numbers out using this method? So that's going to be uh, the point of my lectures. Uh, but uh, maybe any questions about the motivation and uh, Okay, so, yes? So the question is, if I, if I hear it well, if ADS-CFT can do better. Well, I'm not sure I understand the question because ADS-CFT only you know, in ADS-CFT, you only do computations for large N theories, and here there's no large N. Well, there's no, uh, let's put it this, let me put it this way. Uh, there is no computation of this problem using ADS-CFT. In my opinion, it's impossible. Because, because of the large N, there's no large N here. It's a small N, N is equal to one. So. Yes? Uh, it is about two orders of magnitude better than Monte Carlo for this particular problem. Yes? Yes. Excuse me? No, but CFT is obtained from this theory in the limit when you take, uh, so C, to get CFT, to get CFT you have to set M, so cr critical point is realized for, you know, for some value of lambda and some value of mass, let's, let's keep lambda fixed and let's vary mass. And then for some value of the mass, m equals m star, there's going to be a CFT. At this point, uh, you know, the moment you reach the critical point, you cannot vary the coupling anymore. So uh, if, you re if you vary the coupling, then you detune. So you, it's no longer a CFT. Okay. So, um, so we can start then. So what we should then discuss is that, you know, so I told you that there exists some non-perturbative way to think about CFTs. So let me tell you what is this, uh, what are the ingredients? So CFT non-perturbative data. So any CFT is going to be characterized in the first, so we are going to be considering CFT in flat space in this course. There are other, in flat, infinite space. There are going to be no boundaries, uh, no defects. So these, these things are also interesting, but we're not going to discuss them. So the only operators we are going to consider in this course are going to be the local operators. And any CFT will have a spectrum of local operators So there are going to be some local operators OI of X. 
And uh, these operators will have uh, scaling dimension, delta i. and spin. So scaling dimension we already discussed. Scaling dimension is the parameter which tells you how the two-point function decays at infinity. The spin here means uh, Lorentz spin or, or rotation group spin. So our CFT is going to have a symmetry group uh, SOD, so it's going to be well, the full symmetry group is going to be SOD plus one comma one, which is the, the conformal group of the D-dimensional Euclidean space. And this contains uh, SOD, the rotation group. And so the spin of the operator just tells you how this field transforms under the, um, under the SOD. So there are going to be scalar operators, vector operators, tensor operators, fermion operators perhaps as well. Uh, and uh, if, you are in, if you are in larger number of dimensions, then they, they can be also more complicated representations, mixed symmetry representations, and so on. You know, so to know the spectrum of the theory means to know all these deltas and Ls. So to solve a CFT in particular means that you should determine all these numbers, and there are infinitely many of them. So here there is a big difference between the two-dimensional case and, uh, and the d-dimensional case. So in the two-dimensional case, in some theories, the so-called rational theories, of which this minimal model is an example, you have uh, a finite number of primary operators. So here, for example, in, in this uh, M34, there are only three primary operators, one sigma and epsilon, unit sigma and epsilon. So in, uh, in d-dimensional CFT, there is going to be, uh, so if d is larger than 2, there's going to be also always infinitely many primaries. And, uh, you know, as you remember, in two-dimensional CFT, there are two concepts. There is a primary field and there is a quasi-primary field, so in 2D. And the quasi-primary is a field which transforms nicely under the global part of the, of the Virasoro algebra, under the part which, which is generated by L0, L plus minus 1. So this comment is only for those who uh, understand 2D CFT. But, uh, and each primary field in two dimensions contains and signed, con has infinitely many quasi-primary descendants. So the number of quasi-primary fields in 2D is always infinite. But in, uh, in, D, in D larger than 2, we only have the global conformal group. There is no uh, infinite dimensional extension in, in larger dimensions. There is no analog of the Verasoro algebra in, uh, in D dimensions. And so the primaries in uh, Higher dimensions are like quasi-primaries in 2D, and there is always going to be infinitely many of them. So you have to determine these infinitely many numbers. It's of course, going to be a complicated task. And uh, uh, the only reason in present why this is possible is that there is a certain phenomenon of, of decoupling, meaning that uh, if you are interested in operators of low dimension, like, for example, sigma and epsilon, are operators, two scalar operators, which have the lowest scaling dimension. So if you are interested in these operators, then it turns out that the influence of the operators of high dimension, so it's going to be infinitely many operators, and this is going to be their spectrum. In practice, you are, on, you are interested mostly, mostly interested in low dimensions. Because those operators are actually the, the most experimentally relevant. If you, if you measure critical exponents, okay, I did not discuss critical exponents, but anyway, if you, if you make experiments with these critical points, then you are, th these are the operators which are mostly interesting. 
so it turns out that all these other operators, of which there are infinitely many, you cannot just throw them out, as we will see. Uh, but there is a certain decoupling, meaning that as you go higher and higher uh, in, a, in dimension, then the influence of those operators on what happens to the low dimension operators becomes smaller and smaller. And so this is what, this is what makes uh, computation feasible. Questions? Yes? Uh, yeah, that's, that's a very good question. So in, in two-dimensional, so there was a question whether uh, there is an assumption that the spectrum is discrete. Uh, so in, uh, so in two-dimensional CFTs, there are examples of uh, theories with a continuous spectrum. In uh, higher dimensions, it's a conjecture that any CFT has a discrete spectrum. So it's, it's uh, not a proven conjecture, but it's a conjecture. So um, we can make this assumption, but actually if you look closely at how the method works, uh, this assumption is not even needed. There was some other question up there, no? Yes, so the question is how, how these operators are distributed. So that's also a very interesting question. So it turns out that the density of, uh, if the, the density of these operators as a function of scaling dimension grows uh, in any CFT in the dimensions, it grows as e to, the, to some constant uh, times dimension to the power d over d minus one over d. So in 2D, you get e to the central charge times square root d with some constant. In higher dimensions, uh, you know, instead of central charge, you get some other number, and the power changes from square root to d minus 1 over d. So there are exponentially many operators at high, in high dimensions. So that's the first part of, of uh, non-perturbative data. And the second part is uh, OPE coefficients. So, uh, so most of you know, most of you heard about the OPE. So OPE means that we take two operators, OI of X and uh, OJ of Y. And if these two points are close to each other, then we can replace this product of two operators by a sum over all operators k of some numbers f i j k times operator o k, let's say inserted at the point x plus y over two at the midpoint. Um, times times what times uh, times some factor so there's going to be some factor which depends on uh, so what is going to be this factor let's write it down explicitly so x minus y to the power delta i plus delta j minus delta k Can you see it here? Is, is this not blocking the view? Can you see this equation? Okay. So, uh, so here I wrote this equation for for the case where the operators are scalars. Clearly, if there are in, if, if if the operators are tensors, then there are going to be some Lorentz indices, and then you have to you have to modify this equation. So this is for scalars. Um, so these numbers, f, i, j, k, are called OP coefficients. And these numbers represent, uh, you know, also a piece of non-perturbative data about CFT. So if, if you remember about the two-dimensional CFT, 
they were, they were these numbers also here. They were taking a particular you know, sigma times sigma was, so here there was sigma times sigma equals one plus F sigma sigma epsilon times epsilon, and this number was no, a known number in two dimensions. And so here, similarly here, there is some number here. <clears throat> so actually, in order to make everything uh, fixed, you know, you could change this number by changing the normalization of operators. And, but, but let us fix the normalization. So we fix normalization by uh, requiring that the two-point function O i of x, uh, O j of zero, goes as one over, let me take the same index over x to the power two delta i. So th this number is fixed to one. Okay, so in general, there's going to be some number here, call it n, and I'm going to fix it to one. So I'm, I'm going quickly. Anything not clear about this equation? Yes. Uh, no, no, the hash is a positive number. Because, uh, so, uh, so the question is, uh, you know, it looks like this density grows with number. So this density counts the number of operators. How many operators are there? So what this equation says is that there is an exponentially large number of operators. Now, uh, no, but what you, are, what you are saying is distribution. But what, what you are saying also, uh, you know, there is an interesting follow-up to what you are saying is because Suppose now that you want to consider the partition function of this theory. Then at some temperature, you put this theory at some finite temperature. Then, uh, you know, this, this, uh, there, there is a way in which this uh, dimension of the operators can be interpreted as energy if you put the theory on some sphere. So if you compute the partition function, then there's going to be the Boltzmann factor. And it's important that the Boltzmann factor is e to the minus delta over temperature, so it's, it's precisely exponential. While here, we have a behavior which is slightly slower than exponential. So it means that, the, yes, there is exponentially many operators, but the growth is uh, not so fast so that the partition function is actually finite. So, uh, any other questions about the OPE? So, why is the OPE important? So, actually, these two things is basically everything. So, in, in a good zeroth approximation, these two things are everything that you need to know about CFTs. So if you know these two things about the CFT, then basically you, you know 99% about, about your conformal field theory. So in particular, if you know this spectrum and you know these opaque coefficients, then you can compute any correlation function uh, of your conformal field theory in flat space. Not just the two-point function, but also the three-point function, four-point function, and so on. This is uh, something that I would like to, to discuss next. Unless there are any questions. Yes? Uh, no, we don't know all of the CFT data. But it turns out that uh, because of this phenomenon of decoupling, which I mentioned, that you can get high precision numerical results about the low part of the CFT data, so about the low-lying operators, about their OP coefficients, without uh, you know, solving everything about the high dimension 
50 data. So this is very, this is very fortunate because since there are infinitely many numbers to determine, if all of them had to be determined at the same time, this would be a hopeless problem. So in, in two dimensions, you see we were lucky because the problem was finite dimensional because of this uh, interesting property of, of the rational conformal field theories. You just have finitely many objects, finitely many numbers, and then you just write down some system of linear equations and you solve, period. So in high dimensions, this is not gonna work. So, so the method actually is different that, that uh, we are going to discuss. So, uh, so there are some details that I, uh, that I omitted, so let me try to fill them in. So first of all, uh, this distinction into primaries and descendants. So these operators which I mentioned there, these are going to be the primary operators. So if you have a primary operator, it means, so primary means that if you take an operator at the point X and you apply a conformal transformation, then after the conformal transformation, I presume you, you know what are the conformal transformations. Should I discuss conformal transformations in D dimensions or is it more or less, uh, you know, you have, you have uh, inversion. If you have inversion out of inversion and translation, you can build special conformal transformations and that's basically all there is. Right? So it's the only non-trivial one. So if you apply conformal transformation f of x, then you get uh, an operator at the point f of x times some factor, which is, uh, you know, any conformal transformation is a combination locally, it's a combination of rotation and dilatation. And this factor takes into account that since there is a dilatation involved, it means that this operator O has to be rescaled because this, there is a scaling dimension. So I'm not, I'm not gonna write down this factor, it's in my notes, you can look it up. But the, the crucial thing here is that it transforms homogeneously. So you start from O of X and you get after the conformal transformation O at a different point F of X. This is, this is the defining property of, of a primary operator. It's an operator which transforms homogeneously under conformal transformations. So this is for primary. So descendants, so in, uh, in 2D, there are tons of descendants because there are all these of these generators uh, ln of the um, Verasura algebra, and if you act with any of these generators, uh, with, um, with negative generators, then you get a descendant. So in, in higher dimensions, it's simpler. So we only have global, uh, we only have global conformal group. It means that the only raising operator that we have is P mu. So descendants in D larger than two, these are just derivatives. So it's just d mu, uh, d, 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 o. So these are, you know, you can contract some of these indices, but these are all descendants. There isn't, so the descendants are the derivatives in, in high dimension. It's very simple. And if you know how the operator itself transforms under the conformal transformation, and this rule is fixed completely by, by conformal uh, group in terms of, if you know dimension and spin of the operator, then you know this rule. You differentiate, you determine the rule, 
how the derivative is going to transform. And the derivative is not going to transform homogeneously. Because if you act with the derivative, then the derivative can fall on, on the operator itself, or it can fall on this factor. And if, it can fall, if the derivative falls on the factor, you will find that the transformation rule for the derivative involves not just the derivative itself, but also the primary operator. So it's not going to be homogeneous. So it's a transform, not homogeneous. But the important thing is that, you know, the, the, these descendants, uh, well, what is the role of the theory? So on the one hand, uh, uh, we feel that uh, we don't really need to care about these descendants because, you know, it's the primaries which contain, you know, if you know something about the primaries, you know about the descendants. On the other hand, uh, you know, is, do they play any role? Can we completely forget about the descendants, or should we still, uh, you know, should we keep them in mind? Well, we cannot, we cannot completely forget about them, we cannot, at least not at this stage. And the reason is the following. cannot uh, forget about descendants. Because, you know, I, when I wrote that to PE, I didn't write it completely. So let me write it again in a better form. So uh, let's uh, OI of X or J of Y. You see, I, I wrote in the right-hand side, the operator OK. But I inserted it at the middle point. So why did I insert it at the middle point? I, I didn't have to insert it at the middle point. I could have inserted it at X, or I could, could insert it at Y, or I could insert it anywhere between X and Y. So if I make this choice, this arbitrary choice, all these arbitrary choices can be related to each other if I take this operator, say, uh, so for example, I could, exp I, could, I could insert it here, the operator at the point Y. But then the difference between OK of Y and OK of X plus Y over 2 can be expressed uh, by just Taylor expanding as a, as a sum in derivatives of operator OK. So what this means is that if an operator OK occurs in an OPE, then clearly its derivatives will also occur in the OPE. So we cannot, uh, we cannot set the derivative terms to zero. So the more correct way to write the OPE would be would be OK of Y plus derivative terms. So plus uh, let, let's, let's set y to 0, OK, of 0 plus uh, here there are going to be terms of the form, say, x mu, uh, some number times x mu d mu OK of 0 plus some other number, uh, x mu x nu uh, x mu x nu uh, d mu d nu OK, plus dot, dot, dot. So there is an infinite sum of terms. So there is an overall coefficient, the same as I wrote there, x delta i plus delta j minus delta k. But that's the, this is going to be the full form of the OP. And you see, uh, so that's why we cannot, we cannot forget about the descendants, because they, they occur in the OP. And now comes the crucial point that, yes, the descendants occur in the OPE, but the coefficients, with these coefficients with which they occur, they are all fixed by conformal symmetry. So 
So, so there is an overall number, FIJK, which we don't know at this point. It's uh, some free parameter of the theory. But the relative coefficients in, of the descendants in the OPE we do know. Or, or, or rather, you know, what, what do these coefficients depend on? They depend on, uh, they, they only depend on the dimensions. They depend only on delta, on deltas of the fields. So if you know the dimension delta k uh, and uh, delta i, delta j, delta k, then you know all of these coefficients. At least in principle. Any questions? Yes. This FIGK, you mean? Well, well, let me discuss how you fix them. There are various ways to fix these numbers. So. Uh, so one way to fix these numbers is to demand, indeed, that this OPE be invariant under conformal, conformal transformation. So you, you act on this OPE with some, you commute this OPE with a conformal generator, and then you demand that, uh, that everything works out as it should. Then, as you, as you yourself said, because because the, because the conformal generators, they transform uh, primaries to descendants and so on, you will see that uh, for, for, in order to close the transformation property, you will fix these numbers one by one, including the first one. This can be done, but there is a simpler way, uh, there is a simpler way to do this computation, which is uh, to start from the, from the three-point function. So I... So this is probably the last thing I, I, I will say today. So most of you uh, said that they know more or less the constraints imposed by conformal symmetry on correlation functions. So in particular, uh, in particular the fact that so correlation functions so the, there, there is a famous fact that if you take a two-point correlation function, Oi of x, O j of y, then this uh, is non-zero only if delta i is equal to delta j. It can be non-zero. And then, okay, the behavior is x to the two delta y. So th this is really already a consequence of conformal symmetry because if you had just scale invariance, then you could write here delta i plus delta j and it would be scale invariant. But conformal symmetry tells you no. Only if the two primary operators have exactly the same dimension, their two-point function is, can be non-zero. And then there is an analogous equation for the three-point function, or y of x, or j of y, uh, or k of z, well, let me let me put it. Uh, uh, let me put three operators: O one x one, O two x two, here x minus y. Sorry. O three x three. This is equal to some constant, and this constant is going to be exactly the same as as the OP coefficient f one to three. And here I will have uh, x one minus x two to the power h1 to 3, uh, x1 minus x3 to the power h132, x2 uh, minus x3 to the power h231, and h i j k is equal to delta i plus delta j minus delta k. So this formula, which many of you, I presume, have seen, uh, follows completely from invariance under conformal transformations. 
Now, if you take this formula and you expand it in the limit, x1 going to x2, and require that this formula be reproduced by the OPE. So you see, OPE says that you can, OPE says that you can get exactly the same formula by taking the OPE O1, O2, focusing in the right-hand side on the term involving the operator O3, and then match term by term in the expansion in powers of x1 minus x2. And since this formula is exactly known, it means that all the coefficients in the expansion here are also going to be exactly known. Is this, this, this was somewhat fast. Is this uh, clear, the logic? Yes. You mean if, if all these operators have spin, what happens with these coefficients? Well, that, yeah, then, then still uh, there, there is an analogous story. Analogous story. But you see, when we, we take this OPE and you insert it in the three-point function, you get infinitely many terms of the form uh, O3, O3, d mu O3, O3, and then d mu d nu O3, O3, and so on. So this term you know is just normalization. It's 1 over x to the power 2 delta 3. These two-point functions you just find by differentiating the first one. And so you get a series in which you know all the terms apart from these coefficients that you have to fix. But you match the, this first series on the series that you obtain by expanding this three-point function. And this allows you to fix all the coefficients. Okay, so I think, uh, I think that's enough for the first lecture. Unless you have any questions. Okay, ah, there's, there's one more. Could you repeat, sorry? Yes. Yeah, yeah, well, so the question, uh, so if you ch if you shift if you shift the insertion point here, like from zero to to the midpoint and so on, then of course all these terms change. So all these terms they depend at which point you insert. But the leading FAJK does not change. So all these different prescriptions they they only change the subleading terms. Yeah, so, uh, no, you cannot. So, so the argument that I gave that, you know, they can insert x plus y over 2, you can insert the x and you can insert the y, this argument tells you only that this derivative, these descendant terms, they should be present in the OPE. But in principle, uh, this does not tell you with which precisely coefficients. So it just tells you that there is this ambiguity, so you probably cannot exclude those terms. But in order to find the coefficients, you have to do this argument. Yes? Uh, yes, the sum is convergent. Well, in this particular case, uh, you just, uh, I mean, since you know the function, right? You know the function. There's, uh, there is x1, x2, and x3. Uh, so the question was, what is the radius of convergence of this expansion? And in this case, uh, you just see explicitly that the radius of convergence is x1 minus x2 
should be smaller than x1 minus x3. So the, the points, the two points that you are doing the OPE, they should be closer to each other than any other point. Uh, so here you see it by expansion, and then uh, you can give a general argument that this is always going to be the case, even for higher point functions. Yeah. No, for high point functions, you have to give a, a, a separate argument, because for high point functions, you don't know... Yes. Yes. For the two point functions, sorry. Actually, I think we should continue probably since we, this is there has to be a break. Uh, let's, uh, I, yeah. Yes, yes. Okay.